Good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to a security talk. I, was, I wasn't here yesterday, unfortunately, until quite late, but I was very heartened to see a keynote in the security area. So that's just fantastic. Um, I'm sorry the title doesn't quite match the session description, but it is the same content. I just changed the title according to who I think will be in the audience, so don't worry. I'm sure you're all very architecture thinking as well, but you would have been called working developers, but we're all friends here. Uh, I'm Owen Woods. I'm a CTO now, but I still am very technically involved. Uh, I work for a company called Indava you will never have heard of, uh, unless you're one of our clients who happen to be here. I did notice one this morning. We're about 5,000 people. Uh, and my focus is making sure that we've got the right capability. And one of the things I'm very interested in is that we've got the right security capability. And prior to that, I've done both product development, where I, I was a C and C++ developer, but it was back in the times when C++ was a pre-compiler. So it's a little out of date. Um, and since then, I've used lots of different things, uh, both in developing products and doing capital markets. So this morning, what we're going to talk about is very briefly, why do we care about security? You all know, but let's just like have one slide on it. Um, and then why might security principles be of interest to people who are not security engineers? One of the biggest problems in our industry is there's a load of people over here called security engineers, and they know about security, and then there's the rest of us. And we've not been very good over the years in having those two groups interact in a constructive way that both produces secure software and also gets value delivered. And the two groups tend to have quite different objectives. Um, the security group typically be, lo love to be known as the people who say no. So how do we move beyond that, which I think was the theme of the keynote, which was very encouraging. And then we'll look at a set of security design principles. As I will mention, there are many, many sets. I don't claim mine is perfect or the only one or even the best, but it has proved to be useful. So I will share it with you, and you can decide if it's useful for you. Um, then... Once we've talked about principles, that's, they're all good, and that's, you know, that, that's, I think that's useful knowledge. You could take that away. But then suppose you're trying to improve security in your teams, based on what I've done both in a big bank and also we're doing it in Dava, what might we do without some huge five-year, multi-million pound program to actually just improve security every day in the way teams work? I'll talk a little bit about that. So security is important because everyone tells us so. But why is it really important? Uh, it's important, one, well, it's important because it's about protection, and it protects our systems against three kinds of bad things. Malice, mistakes, and mischance. In other words, some people are bad, some people are unlucky, and some people are just plain stupid. But all three groups of people are potentially a danger to our systems. Many of you may have been involved in a production incident that actually just involved somebody being unlucky. And a big bank, I will not name, some time ago, they entirely took out one of their trading risk applications because somebody was unlucky. What had happened was they were doing a large upgrade, inevitably on a Sunday, because it was a legacy system, uh, though absolutely critical to operation, and uh, a script ran, and uh, the guy who run it knew almost as soon as he'd run it something was wrong, because it should have completed in moments and it didn't. It, kept, it seemed to be running a little bit long, but you didn't know what to do, really, because interrupting database scripts is a dangerous thing, as you will all know. Um, so he uh, waited a few more moments, and then he did interrupt it, and then he logged on to a database, and he noticed that the production database had many less tables than he was expecting, <laughs> which is never a good feeling. Of course, they had, they, they had a replicated database server, so you know, all was not, oh. The replication was still linked, because one of the things they didn't want was a huge amount of downtime to catch up afterwards. If there's one thing about replication between modern databases, it's what? It's really fast. <laughs> so as this database was being dropped, the, the replica, in perfect synchrony, was also being dropped. And so they now had an absolutely consistent system, which was useless. Uh, so recovery from that situation, it was a big database, took quite a long time. In the, in the retrospective, everyone had to say, this guy didn't do anything wrong. Well, he did. He made a slight mistake at the command line. But really, a slight mistake at the command line shouldn't allow a catastrophe to occur. The real problem is that when everyone stood back, they said was, we ran scripts as a very powerful user, which didn't need to be. If we'd run these scripts as the application user it was meant to be, there might have been a bit of damage, but the blast radius, as people in the DevOps community call it, would have been much smaller. So that's an example of where security, people don't think of that as a security-oriented thing, but actually security is really important there too. 
And security is not, as you all know, a question of being secure. How many of you have been in a security remediation program? One of the worst things I think people can do, actually, where um, some senior executive says, we need to be secure. And everyone sighs, but, you know, he said it, so you have to do something. So there'll be a reassuringly amount of money, a reassuringly large amount of money is put on the table, and security engineering teams, if there's one thing they can do, spend money, right? <laughs> That's never a problem. So a large program, highly disruptive to normal operation, is put into place. For three or four months, lots of things change, and then everyone reports red, amber, green status, which we all know how, how useful they are, back up to an executive, and at the end of it, you'll be amazed to hear it's all green. Quite remarkable. And then everyone thinks, well, not everyone, but senior people think we are secure. And that's the most dangerous thing I think anyone can ever think is that they're secure. Because security, as you all know, is a risk management business. It's about how much you want to spend on securing a system versus the kind of threats and losses that you might be facing. And so rather than the we'll fix it by buying a lot of stuff, the kind of model you need to get into your senior manager's heads if they don't have it already is it's like paying their house insurance. Do they want the basic house insurance that covers the biggest risks, but, you know, there could still be losses that you hadn't thought about? Or are they going to go for the Hiscox insurance, which is three times the price, but basically they'll pay out on anything? It's that kind of thinking people need to have. There's also there's a lot to security. I keep finding bits that I, I should know about. I, I don't. I've been working in security since... Well, well, I got into security when I worked for Sybase, because we took security quite seriously. And then I actually went to work for a secure systems company, and I realized I knew nothing about security. When you go and work with real security engineers, you realize how much you don't know. But it's a big field. Um, and um, the bit many people talk about is secure infrastructure design. So this is the sort of Cisco certified security people, Cisco certified network architecture. All good stuff. It's not like that's not important. It is. But it's only part of it, because you've also got to deploy the infrastructure securely and keep it secure. Obviously, the keep it secure is often the problem, as you keep changing it. But that's only the infrastructure. And if you talk to most, um, most security engineers, do we have any security engineers here? As I'm lambasting them, one. Somebody can't decide if they dare admit it. Okay. Any other security engineers? Oh, I can be entirely rude to the man. Good. Um, so uh, the, the snag with some security engineers is they come very much from this side of the house. And they actually know a great deal about infrastructure deployment and about keeping it secure and about standards and all those good things. The trouble is, if you run insecure applications on top of highly secure infrastructure, it buys you very little. And what I've been trying to do for the last nearly 10 years, uh, which is why I'm so pleased to see a room nearly full of people, 10 years ago there would have been five of you at the front who were all security engineers, um, is securing the left-hand side, which is how do you design an application securely, and then how do you implement it securely? And then the third piece, underpins it all, is how do you operate it securely? There is little point having highly secure infrastructure and applications if your operations team are almost totally unaware that security is important. This talk is in the top left-hand box. I want to sort of stress that is it's not the complete story. I mean, it couldn't be. I don't know enough to give you the complete story. Even if I did, it wouldn't be a 90-minute session. It would be you know, a couple of days. So these are, these are principles for people primarily designing software applications. So why do we care? Well, um, if we just look at the threat landscape, it's been changing a lot. There's a really interesting website, which has nothing to do with security, called Information is Beautiful, and they are data visualization geeks. Uh, I'm not quite sure who they are, really, but you can contribute stuff to it. It's really sort of high-end demos of visualizing complex stuff. And they've done a nice uh, visualization of a data set which has been made available about data breaches. And back in 2005, it was not good. There were a lot of data breaches. Uh, things you may remember, uh, AOL dumped all of their stuff out, Citigroup lost a load of card data, Deutsche Telekom lost a load of mobile user data. So, you know, even back, gosh, this is many years ago now, we were already losing data. But then by 2009, things were getting quite a lot more um, uh, serious with the British NHS taking a starring role there in the middle, um, managing to lose quite a lot of both patient and, and uh, um, uh, um, staff data at, at different times. Um, lots of very sensitive data from the US military, 
Um, and quite a lot of these you'll see being uh, government organisations, but not exclusively. Betfair appear in the Hall of Shame as well, uh, despite being a very technically aware company. How do you think this is, this is going to progress from a visualisation perspective? <laughs> quite a lot less white space, you're thinking, aren't you? You'd be right. <laughs> So it's getting quite serious now, and Sweden clearly was feeling left out because the NHS had done such a good job. The Swedish Transport Agency managed to reveal a huge amount. And actually, this is, uh, when I looked at it, this is quite out of date. There have been some horrifying breaches since. So it's, just, it's, getting, uh, it's getting harder to visualise. You get the feeling they actually need a different visualisation mechanism now because the whole thing is full. Uh, and of course, you had Equifax, which was really, really serious, Monsac Fonseca. Um, the one they're missing is the uh, Starwood Hotel Group isn't on there. That was uh, a large, really serious one. So it goes on and on. And the reason is, is that the threats we're facing today are systemically different to the ones that were there when I was trained in security. Today, this is a snapshot of the Kaspersky threat map a number of the big vendors have these threat maps. So this, is, this is just a screenshot. If you navigate to it, I don't mind if you want to do it now, you will see it's, it's dynamic. It's being updated in real time. And what they're doing is they have live data feeds from all of their biggest customers for all of their products. And so it is tracking things like phishing attacks, firewall uh, attacks, um, uh, uh, strange, uh, strange network traffic, network traffic originating inside <coughs> secure areas that shouldn't be there. All that's being fed back to them. And then they do a nice visualization of it. The thing that's quite scary is there's always an awful lot of it. You can go there the whole time. Um, I used to work for a large bank, and uh, being a security guy, I got to know the security organization quite well. Um, I asked them once, how often do, does an organization like ours get attacked? You know, how, how often is there something you know, from the outside trying to get in? And they just sort of chuckled, and they said, well, we're never not being attacked. It's just all the time. What's interesting is... How many times do they get through the first level of defense? That's actually what we're interested in. We just assume we're under attack because we are. And actually, um, I've had a minor experience of this myself. I've got, uh, for my own, my own uh, um, delight and hobbies, I've got uh, a little Linux server from DigitalOcean. sits up there in the Di DigitalOcean Amsterdam data center. It's not got a proper host name. It's got you know one of those long sort of hexadecimal names from DigitalOcean. Never given it a proper name. It's got one port open. Guess which port? got port 22 open, yeah, that's all it's got open. And yes, the security engineers will point out I should move SSH to another port, but that would ruin the story. Um, so, um, and some time ago, um, I just thought, I wonder actually, does anyone even know this is here? Because everyone talks about random port scanning. And I went to look in my um, uh, security access log, and it seemed to be quite often people were trying brute force attacks against it to find root passwords. So I wrote a little script that just stripped those out every hour, dumped them in a file, and once a day, um, some of them by uh, geo, did the geolocate on the IPs, and then email me the report. I was absolutely amazed. How many times a day do you think that machine gets just that one attack? It could be having other attacks too. How many times a day? A completely anonymous machine. There's nothing on it. There's nothing of value on it. How many times a day do you think it gets attacked? 150? That's the low end. Yes, that's a quiet day. Yes, yeah. yeah. The biggest days are like 12, 15, 1800 attacks a day. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing that uh, it, there's that much attacking going on on something that's worthless. The other funny thing was the geographies, because as you might expect, uh, China appeared up there, Russia was up there, uh, Korea was up there, and the various other countries, but fourth or fifth was the UK. I thought, how rude is that? You can go and attack somebody else. Gracious. If I'm going to attack somebody, I wouldn't attack them in the UK. It's just bad manners. Um, so, um, Nick, um, I, I wrote a book quite a while ago on architecture. And with my co-author, we have a website. And this was another really interesting thing we discovered quite recently. It's a WordPress site. So in inevitably, it's going to get scanned. WordPress has got something for reputation, as you know, for security. What was slightly chilling about it was... Nick found a very useful security plugin that looks for the access patterns in both the logs and in the requests. Uh, using heuristics, it, it matches them and it cr creates a kind of security incident log. Really kind of interesting. And there was all the normal stuff. There was lots and lots of attempts to log in as admin. What was slightly scary was that uh, within a week or so, we noticed there were repeated attempts to log in with the login names EOIN and NICK. Well, those are our first names, which obviously we actually do use. Luckily, we've got quite strong passwords, but we do use as our login names on the site. So it's not just blind scanning going on. Again, this is not a site that's going to be of huge value to anyone. 
So if people are interested enough to try and hack a software architecture book website, and they're interested enough to actually personalize the attacks, and they're interested enough to 1,200 times a day attack a worthless Linux machine, you can see why the threat, threat landscape is, is, uh, is um, fairly concerning. And part of this is, is that we used to have a lot of our system interfaces um, within the organization, um, whereas now we put them on the internet, which of course means it's great, because it means our partners and customers can connect direct to us using the internet. And isn't so good because it means people in China with too much time on their hands, or even people paid to do it, can also attach direct to us across the internet in an unrestricted way. And in the old days, is anyone, anyone old enough to have used mainframe technology? Or sort of VAX, BMS type technology? A few, yes? Yeah, I mean, those protocols, when you looked at them on the wire, how easy were those to reverse engineer? Anyone tried to debug an LU 6.2 session? You know, it, it's, a great, it's a great hobby, but it, it, it's really quite a difficult thing to do. While well, obscurity is not a good thing to use in security, those protocols were relatively difficult to introspect. What do we do now? We add question mark JSON at the end of our URLs, and we give the hacker a spotter's guide to what's in our API set. So it's actually much easier today to find out what you're attacking. And that also is bound to increase the threat level. So it's one of those security trade-offs. The thing that worries me personally the most is this weaponization of attacks. Some years ago, um, there were people who could attack you in very sophisticated ways, but they were very sophisticated people. There weren't too many of them, and frankly, they had some degree of, uh, some, um, some degree of rationale and reasoning behind what they were attacking, because there was only a few of them, and they attacked very high-value targets. So if you were HSBC, you had to be on the alert for them. If you had a small website for your book, you didn't need to worry so much. What's happened in the last probably five to ten years, but it's, it's accelerating all the time, is what they're calling the weaponization of attacks. In other words, clever people are finding that rather than actually doing the attacks, it's more profitable to enable other people to do the attacks. So they've, they've cracked the lesson that the people in the California gold mine rush um, cracked. It's a lot more profitable to make the spades than to go and dig for the gold. So what these people have done is they've created point-and-click tools and reusable SaaS botnets. SaaS gets everywhere, so now you can not only get a SaaS service for your CRM system, you can get a SaaS service for, your, for a botnet uh, or for an extortion attack, which is nice. So this allows people with much less technical ability, and frankly not much money, to enable themselves to attack you in a, to a, at a level of sophistication would not have been possible until recently. And finally... There's a lot of us involved in um, digital transformations. Who here is, uh, is undergoing a digital transformation? Oh, put your hands up. Your companies must be undergoing digital transformations because Gartner told them to, right? So everyone's having a digital transformation. And that can be good. I mean, our company is guilty of, yeah, or um, uh, applauded, for um, going out and doing digital transformations, which is all good. The thing about it is, is that this means a lot of internal systems that before people weren't too worried about the security of them, they are now directly or indirectly being linked to internet channels. So there's a whole lot of quite, probably quite soft stuff, which hasn't been really very, um, very security aware for many years, and is now quite difficult to change, will be connected to the internet either directly via an API gateway, say, or indirectly via some kind of other channel. So all of these things mean uh, we should be quite concerned. So... How do security principles help us uh, sleep at night? Well, just briefly, what's a principle? Um, it's a fundamental truth, or really, it's a proposition, which we believe to be true, um, which actually guides us to do something. And so a security principle is something we believe to be true, hopefully based on experience, to guide a security design decision. And this is why I think they're so powerful, because they're not design decisions. The problem with giving people design decisions is twofold. One, you're treating them like an idiot, and that's never a good thing and doesn't have a good re result. But secondly, a design decision is quite contextual. So it's quite hard to tell people what the right decision is for their, for their particular situation. They need to do that. But what we do want to do is to give them some mental framework for thinking out what decisions need to be made and how to make those decisions. And that's what a set of principles is. There's an awful lot of, set of sets of design principles out there. Just Google it. You will discover there's 
There's been no, uh, no paucity in uh, design principle sets. Um, Gary Viega and John McGraw, if I'm getting the names the right way around, did one of the first ones. Theirs is one of the classic security development books back 2001, 2002. Um, they came up with 10, and the OWASP organization, is anyone here, everyone heard of OWASP? Good scattering, anyone active in OWASP? I think there's a West of England chapter, isn't there? Not active? Well, good organization to both track and get involved with, if you can possibly make the time. So that's the Open Web Application Security Project, and that's a volunteer, largely volunteer organization, that tries to make things better in application security. They've got a set of principles, also 10. And then NIST in the United States, uh, which is a government organization looking at security, um, being government, they thought, well, why stop at 10? We could have 35-ish. So they've got 33. And then the British National Center for Cyber Security something, something, um, they thought we could go one better. So they've got 44. It is a good set, but have you noticed the trend here? It's quite a lot of principles to remember. And then there's somebody called Cliff Berg. You may have come across him if you're slightly academic bent. He's a systems engineering sort of practitioner meets academic guy. He's got 185, which you, you can't fault his enthusiasm. I do wonder, though, what he thought anyone was going to do with 185 principles. And that's only for security. He's got similar sets for other quality properties. So do check his work out. It's quite overwhelming. When Nick and I came to write the book, because I'd done the security engineering, I inherited the security chapter, and I wanted to put a set of principles in, and one of the real tenets of our book was, we're not going to invent anything. We actually ended up inventing a certain amount of stuff, but it was meant to pull together stuff that other much better people than us had already done. So I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll just include a good set of design principles for security. I'm done. And actually, when I came to read them, I had this problem. I didn't quite know. They were all a bit different, and they all covered slightly different sets of things, and they used different words for the same thing, and it was a bit confusing. So what I decided to do was... I've tried to distill them into 10 principles, because I think you can remember 10. Um, when being a drawn a wasp, uh, um, had roughly the same number. But it, it sort of takes inspiration from some of the others and tries to sort of do a little bit of synthesis. Um, these are obviously brief summaries, because there's one slide per principle, which doesn't give me a lot of time. Um, there are longer descriptions in a free PDF from our website. And clearly, don't be shy about buying the book. Um, Christmas is coming eventually. If you've got one copy, you know, you definitely have an aunt or an uncle who needs a copy of this book. Um, but there, there is a chapter on security where we go into these in a bit more detail. So um, every security talk needs a Hello World system. This is my Hello World system. Uh, it's a little bit kind of enterprise-y, monolithic, but for our purposes, it works okay. Very briefly, there are three sets of users, so three sets of secu uh, human security principles. There are people with purple ties. Who, there's a lot of them, so they clearly do something. They actually do real work. Uh, there is somebody who's close to them and has a tie in a related color. He's got a red tie, but he's, you'll notice there's only one of him, and he's got a jacket, so he's clearly in a managerial kind of role. He doesn't actually do anything, but he does know what these people do, at least. You know. Uh, and then a suitably, a suitably distant from the people actually doing the work. This is presumably in another city in a much plusher office. There's a man with a different colored tie because he's much more important. Uh, and he's an executive. So he's a stakeholder, but he doesn't actually understand what anyone who does anything actually does. But he does know that they need to do more of it for less money. Uh, these people all connect to the system via some kind of networking device, and it doesn't really matter what it is. It's a networking device. You know? uh, and then there's the traditional sort of bastion host web server type model into some kind of large-scale enterprise computing middle tier. Then the interesting bits are there is, a, there is a large data store. This could be anything. This could be a huge Cassandra cluster, or it could be a MySQL running on a single node. It just doesn't matter. But the important thing is it's a single database they're sharing, and then the shiny ball is meant to hint, hint at the boundless possibilities of the internet, because that's a service we call. And the difference between the two is obviously we control this, and it's inside our organization. And we don't control that, and it's outside, but we're dependent on it. So obviously that has implications, which helps me illustrate the principles. So that's my Hello World system. So what are the principles? I'm not going to read them. That's the contents page. But it's just to prove there are 10. I, I wasn't bluffing. The first one is least privilege, which is probably the one that you are most familiar with, even if security is not something that um, people shout at you a lot about. The problem with many 
um, systems, such as our unfortunate upgrader uh, in my an anecdote earlier at the large bank is, we tend to give people a lot more privileges in any security model than they actually need. Um, if we limit privileges to the minimum needed for a specific context, then a number of good things occur. In particular, um, if something goes wrong, so for example, if a particular password is guessed, the access that that um, gives somebody is much, much less. The other thing is, is that if something happens and we need to trace back why it happened, there's a far smaller set of principles, people, that we need to go and think about. So it's about minimizing problems, really. And it's also about protecting individuals. If, for example, a payment gets released that shouldn't be released, and all 500 people could release a payment, then there's 500 suspects, or should we say 500 people who need help to understand their mistake. Um, whereas if there's five, then the 495 clearly had nothing to do with it. So there are lots of benefits to this. The trouble is, there's always a trade-off. This is a lot less convenient. Why do you give everybody root access to Linux, to Linux servers in development? I think it's in production. I'm sure no one does that. Uh, in development. Because it's convenient, because they can just get on with their jobs. Um, uh, uh, if, if you compartmentalize the security, you bring in uh, a lot, lot, lots of administration, people need a lot more help, uh, you need lot, lots more escalations. So my classic example of this is, if you've got 100 services running as separate things, let's call them microservices. I'm starting to hate that term. Has anyone else had enough of microservices? So I really have just had enough of microservices. Um, just call them servers uh, or services. The classic thing here, which is normally in good practice, actually, for lots of financial services organizations say this, you create a security principle for each service, and it, that gets given the privileges it needs for its service. A related principle is to separate responsibilities. So whereas this one is about narrowing down the set of privileges somebody's got, probably in a particular area, separating responsibilities, if you like, is orthogonal to it. It, it. it runs the other way. This is about breaking systems up into separate security domains. This is very common in financial services, where there's often there's principles such as four eyes principle. You need two people from different roles to let something happen or you would not let somebody from the trading area have access to the risk system, or at least not right access to the risk system. People who are involved in financial accounting cannot change trades. That, it's this kind of separation. The reason we do it is it achieves a lot more control across the business process. You're going to, if you're going to defraud an organization, you're going to need the, the cooperation of a whole group of people. One person will not be able to cross the business boundaries to allow the fraud to, to go undetected. And in fact, um, jo uh, it, it really wasn't a joke at the time, but um, th there was a very large financial fraud in a London branch of a large international bank some years ago where this was the problem. Somebody in, was sitting in trading who still had access permissions to systems that we used to control trading. That's exactly why this was able to occur. And they had a detailed knowledge of how those systems worked because of a previous role. Uh, that, that was not meant to be something that was allowed in that environment. It's just that somehow an audit check had failed. So it also limits the impact of successful attacks. If somebody breaks into the CRM system, you would rather that they couldn't start moving money around. Um, so um, the trade-off again is, is that it adds complexity. You've, you've probably now got a grid, actually, of security domains which you need to worry about as opposed to one big one, which is sort of easier to deal with. Um, and the classic example here is that in a retail organization, if you've got people who deal with orders and customer returns, they, they're not the same people that deal with payments, particularly refunds. They may be able to request, but uh, for example, over a certain limit, they can't authorize. There are people who are experts on moving money in and out of the company, and there are people on moving goods in and out of the company. And you don't want those two domains overlapped because of obviously the, the possibility of a fraudulent order then allowing a fraudulent payment. So in our system, the way that we would visualize this is that from the sort of front to the back, maybe not the bastion host, but here, we would have separate security domains. So you could think of it as separate security principles, for want of better terms, or logins, uh, would occur in the middle tier and in the database and when we call the external service. And this, this would give us much more accountability and control. The third principle is sort of an obvious one. And I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, which you're all going to get right. But I think most people um, uh, uh, in the street in Bristol probably wouldn't. 
But there's an awful lot of relationships inside a computer system where we implicitly trust something that's sitting between one piece of code and something else. Who is that person? Or what is that person? Somebody in a white coat. Very good, somebody in a white coat. That's nearly the best answer I've had. I was in the Nordics giving a similar talk to this before Christmas last year. I had the best answer ever. He's an actor dressed up as a doctor in a stock photograph. I thought that was... <laughs> so that's why I like working in the Nordics. It was real precision to that answer. And they were absolutely correct, of course. It is a stock photograph that I found on, on some um, freely, um, free sharing site. Um, what you were all thinking, of course, was, I'm not going to say it's a doctor, because that's what he wants me to do. Uh, and that's because you're in a security session. If you'd seen that on the side of a bus with the NHS logo beside it, what would you have said? You'd probably have thought it was a doctor. Maybe you wouldn't, but most people would, because you're all far too clever for that. The point is, is that we often take a lot of things on trust. We don't validate what we're trusting very carefully. And we see this all the time. The classic way to subvert most systems from a security perspective is to stick a malicious piece of code, or even a malicious person, into a communication chain. So the principle is, assume that the entities that you are interacting with are untrusted until proven otherwise. Um, you need to have a clear process to establish that trust, and then having established it, you need to validate it on a regular basis. So that's sometimes really easy to do, and we do it, and sometimes it's quite hard to do. The trade-off tends to be operational complexity and development overhead. So um, it's obviously good to set up uh, uh, bi-directional trust relationships between all the elements of a distributed system, probably using certificates, because that tends to be the state of the art, meaning we couldn't think of anything better. Um, how does that work out if you have a partial failure of the system and you fail part of it onto some other part of the infrastructure, even in a cloud? Often tends to end quite badly because uh, no one's actually tested that all the trust relationships can be migrated seamlessly. And you often get lots of cascading failures at that point where one trust relationship fails, causing a whole lot of cascading problems. So it adds quite a lot of complexity. And the development overhead, how many of you know exactly where the open source in your systems came from? Nobody's brave enough to put their hand up, which I think is very wise. Um, I think the C and C++ community actually thinks about this quite a lot more than my main community, the Java community, and don't start me about Node. God grief. Um, I've got 5,000 micro pieces that I'm going to assemble dynamically into my system. Oh, fantastic. Are they all secure? Pff, search me. Um, so um, that's another example where it... Um, in fact, quite a lot of our clients have started talking to uh, us in the last year about this is... We've just realized we import a lot of third-party software and it sees all of our data. <laughs> Correct, because you give it to it, yes. How can we be absolutely sure that's secure? Well, it's tricky, isn't it? So, I mean, there are ways of doing it. For example, uh, where well, you can't be absolutely secure, you never can, but you can Im improve your level of knowledge, for example, by scanning it uh, using a third-party scanner. But most people don't, let's be honest. Otherwise, sonar type and black duck and white source would all be, um, you know, living in the Bahamas, and they're not. They're finding it often quite hard to sell their products. Just to give you a kind of reality check on that, this data is quite old, but there are similar studies that have been done more recently with exactly the same result. This, is, this was done by Aspect Security. They're a security research company, a security engineering company. They're highly respected. Uh, it was done as a sponsored thing by, I think it was Sonatype, by one of the scanning companies. So there was a commercial backer, but... I don't believe aspect security honestly would have been um, would have been swayed by that, and also the results are all too credible. What this is showing you is how many downloads these different products had for versions where vulnerabilities had already been announced in that version. This isn't people who got unlucky, downloaded it, and then there was a vulnerability. This is people who downloaded it knowing, or in theory, knowing there was a vulnerability in it. And um, this is a logarithmic scale if you can't see from the back. So that's GWT, Xerxes, Spring MVC, the Hall of Fame. Struts, quite surprisingly, given Struts' reputation, is sort of halfway down. It's only, they only had a million rather than well over 10 million downloads. So well done, Struts. That's only a million uh, vulnerabilities to suck consumer data out of. Um, the one that makes security people laugh the most, if you're scanning ahead, you may have seen it, is this one. Can you read that? It's Bouncy Castle. 
Fancy Castle, the best known, highly, highly verified Java cryptographic module. Oops. When Betsy Castle can get it wrong, you know, I, I think we can all get it wrong. So this is why this open source threat is real. And I know this is from my world. I know it's not the C++ world, but I just have a feeling nearly all open source worlds and maybe third party component worlds have the same problem. The other thing that I came um, uh, uh, across recently is uh, uh, a much more interesting stat. This is so Sonatype, who are a scanning vendor, who do have a vested interest here, but they do relatively independent research. They have a state of state of the software supply chain report they do every year, and the, the, uh, the uh, 2019 one will be out quite soon. This is the 2018 one. In the good old days, 2006, um, it took about 45 days. Sonatype reckon, it's only an estimate, between a, a serious vulnerability being announced in open source and they're finding the first example of somebody exploiting it. That has come down in 2017 to three days. And I think that's for a whole variety of reasons. But the ones we talked about earlier, about network connected systems and the fact that uh, attacks are being weaponized. So the, the people who are creating hacking tools can, can look for these vulnerabilities and build them into their tools very quickly because they're just as efficient a software organization as anyone else. I'm sure they use continuous delivery because um, the, the hacking tools move really quickly. Uh, so that, this means you've got very little time to react, if you're th particularly for things connected to the internet. So in this system here, the kind of questions we need to ask here are who are the people? How do we know that they are who we think they are? Is a username and a password enough? There's uh, one of the large investment banking groups, for example, quite a few years ago now, um, they've put in smart, smart card security for all of their uh, end user devices. Oh, what a pain. I've worked there a bit, and gracious, it's pain. And then you realize it works really, really well. Because your smart card's attached to you, and if you walk away without locking your screen, your smart card follows you, and your screen instantly locks. The other thing is, is that you can't give someone your username and password, you have to give them your, your ID badge as well. Well, you know, sharing a password for 10 minutes, giving someone your ID badge, that's in your contract. That, that, that's not acceptable behavior. So that's one example. Uh, and there are lots of ways of doing it, but that's one example. The other one would be, you know, using mobile phone tokens. Um, working out who's actually connecting. Um, suppose we've got these bastion hosts. Do we know that it's only those hosts connect to our uh, systems of records and our transaction systems, which is where the crown jewels are? Uh, in here, we'll have a stack of open source, because everyone has. Um, we recently um, we did a test on one of our internal systems, and it's 95% of the code, as in bytes, that we ship into production is open source. It's not 95% not of the intellectual property, if you like, because only some of that open source is, is really in use. But there'll be a whole stack of open source here. Where did that all come from? And even if it's not open source, are the vendor libraries, if you're buying vendor libraries, are they up to date? What can access the database? Because this, after all, we all remember the, the bubbles. The bubbles are getting bigger, less white space. That's what they're after. What can access the database? Can, you know, can something running here actually access the database? Do our net, does our network allow that? Can somebody from outside the organization actually access the database? Maybe that's necessary. Maybe there's a third party vendor involved. But how, how is that secured? Um, I mean, how many times is that done in a hurry? to meet some kind of a deadline, and it's going to be made more secure later. And then what, uh, the flip side is, what are we actually connecting to? We think we're connecting to a secure service that moves money. How do we know we are connecting to the right secure service? All, in a sense, obvious questions. But I'll put my hand up and say, there's many systems I've worked on, I couldn't answer all of those. So I don't know how you're feeling at the moment, but it always worries me when I go through my checklist. I think, hmm, it's quite a lot here I don't know the answer to. The next principle is be simple. Pick the simplest solution possible. This is um, uh, sort of in tribute really to uh, um, Tony Hoare, a uh, great hero of mine really in computing. Tony Hoare actually didn't really chase security for most of his career. He was very interested in reliability, which is why he, he spent many, several decades working in formal methods. And then at QCon confessed, I've spent two decades solving the wrong problem, which I thought was very humble from a man who's uh, been lauded so much for work in that field. Uh, it was, a, a, I thought, a very self-aware kind of comment. His point was, if you're going to be reliable, you need to be simple, because otherwise you won't understand it. It's exactly the same with security. If you don't understand it, it will not be secure. I can almost guarantee it. Bruce Schneier used to, but he used to be more in the practical rather than the policy end. It was a constant 
um, um, thing Bruce Schneier used to say. Make it as simple as possible. So you need to actively de design for simplicity. The problem is, how many of you work on a system that's more than five years old? Yeah, me too, yeah. So, um, and how many of you have got some kind of product owner? Giving you a stream of features into it, you know, product lines or business users, yeah? And you know those people, have you ever had this conversation? I'd like to take some features out. Oh, right, that sounds a very, that, that'll make you more secure, won't it? Yeah, you should definitely do that. And we should take a couple of sprints out so you can take some features out. That's an excellent idea. Have you ever had that conversation? No, I've never had it either. You have, that's actually really impressive because almost, almost never is that conversation, uh, um, uh, does, it, does it end the way you, you'd like it to? So my anecdote is, um, I was working in a system in a bank and we offered, a, uh, it did lots of things, it was a platform system. We offered API service to other parts of the bank and when it was built, SOAP was the state of the art. That's how old I am. So we had SOAP RPCs coming into it that were working perfectly well, let's be clear, they're working perfectly well. Um, but um, somebody quite quickly pointed out that we'd probably be easier and more resilient if we also had a message interface. So sure enough, we popped a message interface on. For various reasons I will not bore you with, it didn't call the SOAP interface directly, but it went into the system slightly differently. So we had two interfaces, um, which was sort of fine, because we used the same SOAP message format in the messages. So rightly or wrongly, um, it, it was very consistent. Uh, time passed. And then the development team realized that no one was using SOAP anymore, and they frankly wanted to do something that was far more CV relevant than that. So we immediately realized that there was a compelling business reason to put um, a JSON over HTTP version of the API and make that available to other teams. Uh, sure enough, that happened, and people started consuming it. And then we realized we had a lot of duplication here, and the SOAP bit was a bit of a security liability because it was quite old libraries. Um, so we wanted to switch it off. How do you think that went? We were being connected to by about 40 systems, to put it in, into context. So about 30 of the conversations were, yeah, that's fine. I, I don't think we use that anymore. And if we do, we will get off it. And then 10 of the conversations were, no. Silence. No, no but there's all these advantages. Yeah, I don't care. No, we're not doing it. Because our system's old, or we're replacing it, or we haven't got time, or whatever it was. So actually, achieving the simplicity in a system both requires a lot of design ability, which people at you, I would say us, uh, definitely people who come to ACU have got a lot of design ability, but it also requires the discipline in the organization to allow systems to evolve towards simplicity, because you very rarely get there in one step, agreed? Simplicity comes through wisdom and experience and refinement, and that requires multiple steps. So it's easy to say, but it's often quite difficult to do. But one of the, I mean, we all like simplicity really as engineers. This gives you another reason to go back to <clears throat> somebody senior and go, this needs to be refactored. It's a security problem. Often today, that's one thing that does get their attention. The fifth principle is audit-sensitive events. Um, this is very common in some domains and not others. Um, the principle is to make sure that you record all significant events, and that's very context-specific. That's why you can't give someone a design decision. Um, but all effectively business transactions need to be recorded somewhere so you know who did them, when they did them, and what happened. This allows you, one, to deter people from doing bad things. If people know that they're being monitored, they're a lot less likely to do bad things. And the second thing is if, if something does happen, you can go back and find out what really happened rather than what people think happened. So audit trails are quite important for enforcing security and also encouraging good behavior. They do come obviously at some kind of performance and complexity cost, and they add to development. So those are, I, I don't think they're a huge cost, but they do need to be added in. So uh, an example would be many of the systems I've worked on, they've got an audit trail which any time you change a core business entity, and that's no, normally something the audit group want to take a look at and work out what is core, if you change it, then they make a record of that, independently from the data change, the data may be versioned. There's a separate audit trail entry which says user X at this time from this IP address changed this entity. Um, one of the complexities, of course, is what a tamper-resistant store is. Because if somebody can break in with the database user and then um, modify the audit trail, that's not very useful. And actually, creating secure audit trails, it's all a question of judgment. But actually, it, it, it's, that, that's something of an engineering challenge. If you go to Google search, tamper-resistant append-only stores, unfortunately, the main hit you get back is blockchain. No, no, don't even think about it. Um, so um, 
there is, I think, one open source project I came across some time ago that does try and implement this. Um, what, what I've done it, actually what we've done is we've created a separate security domain inside the database layer with different security credentials. And then the only um, authority anybody else has to that is to insert into it. And then you can't see what's in it, you can't modify it, and there's a different set of credentials are used for, for maintaining that table. So that's an example of us uh, se separating, separating security domains. So in this case, obviously, we would add a separate store, and it goes round and round and round, so therefore it must be append only, um, and we will send a, a stream of security events into it. You're halfway. Chin up. Um, principle six is use secure defaults, and when you fail, fail securely. Who's been using, who's used the Oracle database in your systems? Oh, almost done. Good grief, you've, you've lived charmed lives. You really have. Um, so it's my favorite, but who's used Mongo? Oh, come on, you must all have a copy of Mongo on your laptops. Every developer has. Um, what does Mongo do by default for security? Nothing. Yeah. What happens when you in install Mongo with an open port on the internet by default? Nothing. That's why you can scan the internet and find, in fact, people do, security researchers do all the time, and find MongoDBs with very sensitive things in them that are clearly not meant to be internet connected but are. It's just mind-blowing to me that they allow it to be installed onto anything other than like a micro machine, and they don't even put a basic password uh, into into the root account. Uh, it's just amazing. But um, that's the default thing. The other thing is when things go wrong, make sure that doesn't open up a security problem. Uh, when I worked on the Sybase database quite a few years ago now, um, we implemented an audit trail uh, in the version 10 because it was being demanded by lots of our Wall Street customers. And we did all the right kinds of things. We had a separate database. We brought in a separate system level role to control it so that the super user couldn't access it. It was all pretty secure. Um, and uh, we um, uh, then had to decide on the behavior when the, if there was a problem with the audit trail. You may remember Sybase made their name in trading systems. So the two things that they prided themselves on, we never go down and we, uh, we, we never slow down. Never go down, never slow down. So the first version of it made a very bad security decision. If they couldn't write to the audit trail, and that was typically because it was full, they suspended auditing, admittedly with an alert, but they suspended auditing and continued. And that lasted until we shipped the beta to a large bank who tested it and kind of went, we found a terrible bug. When, you, when the audit trail fills up, it stops auditing. Yes, we said, isn't that fantastic? Trading system will carry on working. And they kind of went, that's the point. If somebody can fill the audit trail and disable it, it's useless to us. Could you switch that the other way, please? And with 2020 hindsight, I do accept it was a pretty stupid decision. At the time, though, it seemed like the right thing to do because they'd want their system to keep going. Um, so at the application level, it's quite often when there's a failure, we need to think about when we're recovering, how do we keep things secure? And how do we make sure that when it's in the failed state, we don't accidentally make it secure? So the bottom one is a bottom one is an Oracle example. Uh, to give the or Oracle anecdote, it used to be with Oracle, it created about a dozen logins when you created a, a server, all with well-known passwords, many of them with quite a lot of authority in the server, and it just left them there. So it was very, very common. You would go up to an Oracle server and find one of the standard logins was, was still enabled. So um, that, that, that was a huge problem. Um, don't rely on obscurity. Notice it says don't rely on obscurity. There's actually nothing wrong with a bit of obscurity in your security system, but you should never rely on it. Um, you've only, or, the principle is, assume your attacker has a perfect knowledge of your system, including the ability to remove obscurity. Are you still secure? If you are, fantastic, you are secure. If you're relying on obscurity, somebody will get past that, because it, uh, obscurity is not the same thing as security. That can slow an attacker down significantly, but it won't stop one. Um, the trade-off, of course, is, is that this takes time and effort. Um, my canonical example of this is, um, support, suppose you have uh, port knocking set up on your um, Linux systems, re relying on the fact that um, the um, that attackers will never guess the port knock sequence. So port knocking is where you have to open a sequence of different port numbers before the one you really want, and then that one gets opened. Assuming that people will never guess the port knock sequence is a bit risky, to say the least. But um, quite common, people will say, well, 
this has massively increased our security. Well, it's helped, but saying it's massively increased your security, uh, I, I think he's uh, pushing it. Um, related things are things like uh, using encryption with known keys. That's not encryption. That's obfuscation, because people will find the keys at some point. Um, and um, breaking up information and hiding it. I remember when I uh, learned C program in Unix, this again was a long time ago, uh, one of the classic books teaching it, uh, th this wasn't Koenig and Ritchie, this was one of the Unix specific books. It had an example where they wanted to store a password in memory. And the example was that you had to use, uh, what was it, did you have to, you had to use separate variables for each of the characters rather than an array. Because if you did that, it didn't have a zero at the end, then um, the strings program wouldn't allow you to take the password straight out of the binary. That's still just obscurity. Obviously, people will find it anyway. Principle eight is defense in depth. Things, up, things will go wrong. There are any number of security examples in, in the wild now, and we're getting better at reporting them, where things are going wrong. So things do go wrong. And as our friends at a certain bank I was telling you about, they knew things could go wrong because they monitored, monitored them all the time. So mistakes are made. So relying on a single point of security is always going to be dangerous because we can nearly guarantee that any single point will be breached. The question is, when that breach happens, what happens next? Well, hopefully, having breached one level of security, there's another one they have to immediately break, which is quite different. And that means you're much more secure. It, uh, you're also far less attractive to attack because part of this is a sort of probability game. The question is, will somebody attack you or someone else? There's likely to be a range of targets which are, re which are quite similar. Uh, providing you're the hardest to attack, you're unlikely to be the one attacked. So we want to, we want to make sure that um, we've got a number of layers of defense in our system, from network through to operating system, through to um, a database, through to table, and so on. The problem you get with this is it's the complexity. How many layers of security can you put in a system today? If you even sort of running on a cloud, if you think of the sort of policy stuff at the network level, at the node level, at the middleware level, at the data store level, at the application level, maybe something in the user interface, there's an awful lot of levels. How many people know all of that security technology and can check it to be correct? Not many. It's, it's, it's really difficult. As soon as you get into defense in depth, it's really difficult to make sure that it's correct and will function the way you want it to. But secondly, it doesn't have security holes in it. It certainly pushes you towards automation, but it also, um, it also causes you to stop and think about how many levels you, may, you maybe need. Every level's got to be adding something significant to make it worth adding another level. So in our little system, we obviously have got some kind of network device, logical or physical, city on the outside, which is controlling access into our network. And then we would have some kind of hardened level of um, um, node. Um, these are probably the ones that have got core OS rather than full Linux. They've got none of the dev tools there, uh, or they're running SE Linux. Um, they're quite difficult to work on deliberately. Um, everything's done remotely and pushed to them. Um, and once you get onto them, there's a very limited pl uh, number of places that you're allowed to traverse network-wise. So they're a kind of hostile environment for an attacker. Then we would, our middle tier would be secured, both the individual pieces and the overall um, area, both with network controls and uh, access controls, probably. And then, obviously, our database is kind of the crown jewels. We have another level of uh, security around the database. And even inside the database, some uh, elements of your database will be much more valuable than others, or you, you may separate them into separate databases. We, uh, we put different levels of security control on different parts of the database. Number nine is probably my favorite because of the number of <laughs> things I've seen over the years that um, uh, 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 broke this principle. Don't invent your own security technology. Um, I, I think uh, this is probably one where, uh, for an ACC audience. Uh, I don't need to say it, really. You are probably the most sophisticated technical audience I ever talked to. But it keeps on happening. And it's more probably the people you work with and deal with you need to be thinking about um, spotting this. Um, creating security technology is difficult, and security people themselves 
people who specialise in this will say it's very difficult. You remember Bouncy Castle had vulnerabilities in it, and they're real experts. Um, hacking team. Do you remember the hacking team incident? So hacking team are an organisation that creates surveillance technology, to give it a, 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 a direct term, and they sell it often to quite unpleasant governments. Well, a group of anonymous hackers on the internet took exception to what hacking team were doing, and they decided they were going to attack hacking team. So they did. They turned them inside out. They got everything, including who they'd sold software to, how much it had cost, all of the uh, contacts of the people that they dealt with in security agencies around the world, uh, copies of code, code that they were working on, the whole nine yards. They, they kind of got everything. So security is just difficult. If you build your own security technology, or even when you're configuring complicated security technology, it takes time to get it right. Um, and if you do have to do it, you need to make sure there's real experts involved and you get a lot of peer review because it's very unlikely you'll be right first time. Uh, so for example, don't create your own single sign-on mechanism. I know quite a number of organizations who have created their own single sign-on mechanism, um, and some of them are still running. So that, that is not unknown. Um, secret storage. You know, where do you put your passwords in a system? If you need credentials to connect to other places, where do you keep them? Now, I know you all use a trusted, verified secret store running on the network that's hi highly hardened. But I'll tell you where most people keep them, in a properties file or a config file, hashed normally, not actually encrypted, because if you encrypt them, you, 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 you still have a secret problem. Where do you keep the key to decrypt them? So most people hash them with a known key. So um, that is creating your own security technology, and that is clearly not a great thing to do. So we need to, prove, we need to choose proven things, give them time to mature, and make sure we understand them. In our system, my example is keeping passwords in a password store. It would be really good if we replaced that with a proper secret store. That's the icon for HashiCorp Vault, which is the current darling of the secret stores. But there are a number of secret stores around. It's not, Vault is not the only one. It's just very well known, and it's free because it's open source. Um, and it, it's been used in a lot of places. But all the clouds supply secret stores for good reason. And they're all you know, well-designed, hardened, you know, uh, reviewed all the time. With utter relief, I can announce this is the 10th. So the 10th security principle is really it summarizes security. Secure the weakest link and keep on doing it. The reason we do this is, the, uh, is what I call the paper wall problem. This is really interesting. Uh, well, it is to me, so you're all going to suffer it. Um, is that um, I've been using this term for years. The idea is if you have a castle with a moat and four walls, if you have three really secure walls and the back wall is made of cardboard, you haven't got a very secure castle. When you look at a lot of systems, they've got one of their walls is made of paper. And they, that's the bit that needs to be secured. Uh, the interesting thing was, somebody from ThoughtWorks came to one of my talks about a year ago, and he emailed me and said, really interesting that analogy. I really like it. Well, I'm starting to use it. What's the reference for it? Where did you get it from? And I said, I, don't, I picked it up from a book years ago. And he said, well, it's funny you say that, because I've searched Safari and uh, Library of Congress and Web of Knowledge, and, and, and I can't find it. I went, oh, maybe I made it up. Uh, actually, I think what happened was at Intertrust, we had our own security research lab, and I think some of our researchers used that term, and perhaps it's buried in an obscure paper one of them wrote. So I don't know the provenance of the term, but it's an analogy which I found very powerful. People get it immediately. If you've got the weakest link, that's the bit you go and secure, and then you worry about how thick all the other walls are. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the principle is you find the weakest link in your security, and then you strengthen it, and then you repeat the process. And the security engineer's approach to this is called threat modeling. How many of you do threat modeling on your systems? Yeah? Oh, a bit, that's okay. We've been told. We don't know how to. Oh, we've so been told to. That's slightly different. That's the guy in the blue tie, isn't it? He's been talking to Gartner, and Gartner said, do you do threat modeling? And he went, no, we'll get right on it. I said, do threat modeling. Um, which is not nearly as hard as it sounds. Uh, I, I do a presentation on threat modeling, which um, my colleague Vlad Kalmik, who's our head of app security, um, goes around and down all the time explaining threat modeling. I mean, threat modeling is not rocket science. And there's a good book I would recommend at the end uh, will show you just how unrocket science it is. Uh, but th this, is, this is fundamentally the security engineering process. Find the weak bit, improve it, repeat. Um, my classic example here is where you've got a really cleverly locked up database. People have thought hugely carefully about the access control. You've encrypted it at rest within the database, and then you back it up. And what happens to the backups? 
No one knows, because it's part of operations. And operations go, we send it off-site. Yes, but how do you send it off-site? We squirt it down a network connection, and it goes to some other company. Oh, is it all secured? Probably. They're, prob they're very good. They, they normally think of that kind of thing. How about the network connection? I oh, don't know, I haven't checked. So everything's been secure until there's one step in the process that somebody wasn't quite on message, and actually we've got a huge security hole. So again, we fix that one, and we go, what's the next weakest thing? And we, 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 we will keep finding them. So my 10 principles are, assign the least privilege you have to. <clears throat> Separate responsibilities as much as you can. Be careful what you trust, both in everything, things you connect to, people using your systems, um, pieces of software that you're calling, pieces of software that you're importing. Be as simple as possible, because that way you've got a good chance of understanding the system to work out if it is secure. <coughs> Considering or, consider auditing sensitive events, especially in business transaction type systems, because then that's a major um, uh, motivator for people to behave well, and then if something does go wrong, you've got a fairly trustworthy store to go back and find out what the, what the sequence of uh, um, steps was. Uh, again, it's a different presentation, but attacks are very rarely one thing. They're a long chain of what can look like quite innocuous steps. That's where the audit trails can be really useful, because you go back and go, oh, I see now. It took seven steps, but that's how they did the credit transfer. When you're building systems, and especially using third-party software, check that there are secure defaults. And if you're a product company, which I know you get more product companies here than most audiences I talk to, make sure that when you ship your product, it's secure out of the box. Um, uh, so, for example, don't allow people to set it up without putting basic uh, credentials into place. And when things go wrong, make sure that the system is still secure. Go through failure cases. We mustn't rely upon obscurity. There was nothing wrong with a bit of obscurity. It doesn't cause a problem. In fact, it can be useful, because it, it does mean that the casual passerby um, can't um, uh, get access to information. But obscurity is never security in itself. Things will go wrong. We will get breached. So make sure that we can uh, have multiple levels so that how, when one level is breached, then there is another level to stop them and another level and so on as we get towards our most sensitive resources. Don't invent or indeed deploy other people's invented security technology. Don't be the first to, uh, to work on a, a newly shipped system. Um, make sure that other people have looked at it first. And to summarize the whole process, find the weakest link in your security, improve it, and repeat. So how do you actually do this if you have real teams who aren't full of security-aware people? They may or may not care about security, but they don't know much about it. Well, when you start, you'll get quite a lot of concerns, both from management people and from engineering people, such as the first question will be, what tool are we going to use? That is the first question I've heard in lots and lots of client teams. Can we buy a new tool? Uh, well, you can. It won't improve your security, but if it makes you feel better, by all means, go buy a new tool. Uh, this is going to cost a lot, isn't it? Well, it depends what you compare it to. Compared to having your, your user data all over the dark net, I'd say it's pretty cheap. Um, who, who should be involved? I think we have a security group. I think they could do it. Well, as I think the keynote yesterday said, no, 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 they won't do it. In fact, they shouldn't do it. Um, we can't do this because we're agile. We have to keep, keep stuff moving to production all the time. It's not possible to, to build your security processes in. No, it definitely is. Um, and won't this slow everything down? What we have found is that some people, God bless them, will find this fascinating, and some people, God help them, will absolutely hate it, because they're going to have to do some of it, but some people will just, just hate it and find it tedious. Teams need a lot of guidance, and actually they need a bit of inspiration as to what good looks like and to why, why this is not going to destroy their working environment, and the fact that they're on a journey, and that they should you know, be, get recognition and reward for getting on the journey. The biggest anti-pattern, and one that I've been battling for years in big financial organizations, is security engineering own the process. They tell you what to do, they give you a tool, they check, it out, check you've run it, they've got an Excel spreadsheet full of names, and they, they want to turn them all green. At the end, everyone goes, well, I think you'll find we're secure. Uh, it's not security engineering's process. Security engineering need to re-enable themselves as enablers of the teams. Uh, a bit like we're now talking about DevOps. Right? We don't want infrastructure experts doing everything 
and then handing it to the teams. We want them empowering teams to be able to do their infrastructure work. Just the same in security. It's another similar specialization. Uh, it does help, though. Um, so the opposite anti-pattern is you say to the teams, you are empowered. Go and be secure. And then off you go. And the team goes, huh? I, I, I have no idea. I don't even know which book to read. So a defined starting point and a set of standards for them to start from and also a set of red lines, actually. I shouldn't have said red lines, should I? Very sensitive topic at the moment. Um, um, a, a set of do's and don'ts is actually quite useful because um, the teams do like to know wh wh where the boundaries are. And finally, having a roadmap helps people to avoid overload so they don't try and do everything on day one. They do go, yes, so well, this is simple. Because the security engineers know this is quite easy. Oh, this is very hard. And there's all the bits in between. So let's start with easy and then move up towards very hard. Let's not go, oh, advanced code analysis, that looks fun, yeah, but it's very hard. Let's not start there. So the tactics we found work are form a group of security champions. That's the people who love it uh, and invest in them um, and involve many kinds of people in that. It's not all devs. There should be testers. There should be business analysts if they're interested, project managers, you know, architects, you know, whoever's interested, infrastructure people, application managers. Um, the people who really are interested in security and genuinely interested, get them into a team because they will support each other and then give them the investment to grow. Make sure that the importance of security is understood from the very top. If your executive managers are talking in an intelligent way, as opposed to be secure, in an intelligent way about security, people will get the point. I've seen this in a couple of big organizations. Uh, I'll name one, actually, Cisco. Cisco, from the very top, make it very clear to everyone, security is job one. Do you understand? And everyone talks about it. You know, exec corporate executives, VPs of engineering, team leads, principal architects, everyone talks about security. So it's obviously important. Try and make, try and make the behavior you're after the easy thing to do. So things like simple stuff like package tools up. Make sure the information people need is somewhere accessible and not in a share point that's locked away inside security engineering that no one wants to use. And also, it's not going to happen quickly. And this is the biggest disconnect I find with the executive level. It's, right, we've got to get this done. How much is it going to cost? Three months? You go, no, it's going to cost a lot, three and a half years, to get some initial organizational rollout. How about that? And people go, oh, it's just too long. We've got to do it in three months. You go, well, it'll take as long as it takes. You know, keep on moving. Every month you should have a bit of progress, but it'll take as long as it takes. So the gradual process that I would kind of model is that you start off not really having any institutionalized security practice, and then you get teams that at least know what security is and what it might mean for them. They're not particularly experts, but they're already thinking, that looks a stupid thing to do, maybe we should ask someone, or hang on, we've not really done anything about security this release, why don't we improve something? They're, they're aware. And then where, honestly, I think a lot of people stop, uh, and it's probably fine in many cases, uh, you get quite an informed team. I mean. They've probably got a champion or two. They basically know what they're doing. You, they, they don't self-identify as security specialists or experts. They're not working on secure software. But they, knew, they do know how to avoid all the common mistakes. And they do think about security in their life cycle. And that's a pretty good place to aim for to start with. Above that, you get the kind of highly competent application security teams. They're using advanced tools. They're uh, probably contributing to the community. They're in their local OWASP chapter. You know, they, they really are part of security, and maybe they're, they might be actually involved in building secure software. And finally, you get expert teams, where um, these are probably people working for secure systems vendors, government agencies, the armed forces. They're building uh, verifiably secure software. So <clears throat> this is just an example, but what you need to do is figure out what level you think you're aiming at, and then what practices are going to go in at each level. So you know, I would say, Security principles, OWASP top 10, basic security coding, do some penetration testing. You're kind of security aware. You know about it. You're not experts, but you know. You do know there are things to remember and things to try and check. An informed team is starting to do, think about secure coding practice more actively. Um, they're, they've read a few books on secure design, and they're thinking about how to improve that. They're starting to manage their open source, so they realize that, there is a, that there's a really rich attack vector there. Um, they're doing st static scanning of their code in their pipelines. They're thinking about security requirements earlier. And they've got security requirements in, the, in their release criteria. And then as you go up towards the competent team, they're doing threat modeling. 
they're doing much more reviews. And security design and implementation is just what they do, because they know about it, and they think it's important. And then above that, you've got um, uh, more advanced techniques that um, uh, you know, specialist security companies or the internet companies would be doing, which honestly I don't see in many organizations outside that domain. There are a couple of models that might help or might just make you run, it, run screaming from the room. Um, OWASP have one called SAM. Um, what they've done is identified that there's four bits to it to make it work. There's that word I loathe, I'm not even going to say it, it starts with G, um, which really means guidance and oversight. There's how you build the stuff, there's how you check it's correct, and then there's how you deploy and operate it. And what they say is, if you miss any of these pillars, it's a bit like my first diagram, if you miss anything from these pillars, you're probably not going to be successful. You're, you, you're, you're, you're going to have gaps. And for each of these boxes, if you go to OpenSAML, they've got some quite detailed guidance about how you might go um, um, about these. Microsoft have their secure development lifecycle, which unfortunately they have written as an utterly rigid waterfall, which is very, very unhelpful because everybody in modern development looks at it and goes, well, we're not doing that because we cannot do a waterfall. That don't, that, well, actually, if you think about it more as it's a, it's a loop, which it would be nice if they drawn it as a loop, if you think about it more as a loop, that's more of a process that people are prepared to follow. Um, you maybe do training first, but every... Every increment, you're thinking about security requirements, you're working out if you've got design problems, you're implementing it securely, you're checking what you've done, and when you release it, you make sure that um, uh, uh, whatever's being released makes things better, not worse. So things like the incident response plan. Um, it's also quite aimed at product developers, so a lot of the language in it, um, uh, understandably, it was developed for Microsoft, a lot of the language in it doesn't gel all that well with um, app, app dev teams in, say, you know, mobile banking organizations. Um, what I think I would say is that for informed security people, there's an awful lot of good advice there because Microsoft has done a huge amount of work over the years, the last 10, 12 years, to build secure products. We will remember what a laughing stock they used to be. And now they've, um, that they've put a huge amount of effort into rectifying that. So there's good advice in it. It's hard won. It's just presented in a way that a lot of people go, oh, that's not for us. So to recap, we've seen 10 security principles I think they're straightforward and accessible, and I reckon at least seven of them, depending on the person, weren't news to any of you. However, can you take those away now and apply them to your project? Maybe, maybe, maybe for you, maybe not for you, but for the entire project team. But these are things we should be thinking about to make ourselves a security-aware team. And then you might want to think about how are we going to improve capability over time, and so we might want to think about what level of team we want to be what kind of security problem we've got, and then what practices we think fit at each level so we can start to track our progress and start to think about what practice is next. And should you want to, there are a couple of quite heavyweight models which can give you some ideas about how to progress your own security practice. I'm not going to go through them, but there are lots of references. Obviously, the slides will be published, so you can click through to the references. On the books, the one I'll mention is threat modelling. I don't know, has anyone here read Threat Modeling? Adam Shostak's book. So Shostak is now an independent consultant, but he spent five plus, maybe eight years at Microsoft, based in Redmond. He is the man who spearheaded their whole approach to doing threat modeling for all of their product teams. Given where they started, you can just imagine what he must have thought on his first day at work. Crikey, where do I start? And they were successful. They now they have institutionalized threat modeling across a lot of the, a lot of the organization. And that's one of the reasons their security's got so much better. So the thing I like about threat modeling is it's not a top-down treatise on why it's good and here's how you break it down and here's the 14 tasks. It's actually, here's, here's an approach we've used and refined quite a bit, and here's lots of how-to. Here's forms, here's a game you get people to play, here's um, how you deal with blockers, here's some of the things that will go wrong. So it's got lots of practical advice in it. Uh, all the other books, uh, well, this one is obviously the one you're buying for Christmas, um, all the other books are sort of classic security texts. Um, if you're a security engineer, run, don't walk, and read security engineering. Um, it's the kind of... Uh, uh, Professor Ross, Ross Anderson from Cambridge. It's the classic security engineer's text. He's now giving it away. You can still buy the second edition from Wiley, but he got permission from Wiley because it, it's some years old now. He gives the PDF away on his website, so there's, there's no excuse not to have one. 
What I'm worried about these books is that when you open a lot of them, such as Viega McGraw has got lots of good advice in it, but it was written some years ago, so the code examples um, are perhaps unfamiliar. Less so for this audience, because he does quite a lot of C++, but um, he, uses, I can't, he uses a couple of languages. Um, the, the point about it is the practice and the principles he's trying to explain haven't changed. It's just that the stuff we implement in the men have. And you will find this in security books repeatedly. The books last for a long time because the principles and practice don't change radically. It's just, that it's just what we do them in does. So don't be put off if you pick up a book and go, there's no templates or that's very old C++ or whatever. I think you'll find there's still plenty of good stuff in the books. Um, and some of them have been updated, but not many actually. A lot of them are still in their classic form. Thank you. We've got five minutes if you all um, have the energy uh, to, uh, to do questions. But thank you very much for coming. I hope you found that useful and it's something you can take back to work. <laughs>